the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hi, everyone. It's me again, Lacey Bonar Hall, and I'm here today with the second part of our episode on the disappearance of the princes in the tower for the mini series on rumor and gossip at the Tudor court. If you haven't listened to the first part of this episode, you'll want to check that out before this episode. If you've already listened to the first part, then let's jump right back into the conversation with Matthew Lewis. Nathan Amin, and Nicola Tallis about the fate of the princes in the tower. I know what I want to hear, and I think it's probably what listeners want to hear, and it is your takes uh, on the possibility of these three big historical players being involved in the disappearance of the princes. So what I would like to do now is go person by person and just ask you about the possibility of the person who you specialize in, because you, I mean, I feel like the three of you, you know, the lives of these historical figures. So I think you're all, you're well-placed to give your opinions. And we're all going to remember that these are opinions. Obviously you can't know with 100% certainty if these people were involved at all in the disappearance of the princes. I would like to get your takes on the likelihood of them being involved. So Nathan, we're going to start with you. So With Henry VII, in your opinion, did he possibly have any involvement in the disappearance of the princes? No. (laughs) (laughs) No. I I think there's quite valid reasons why I come to that conclusion. First and foremost, you know, the rumors we have of the prince's demise, they all start in that chaotic summer of 1483. You know, we can pull apart the sources all we want, the fact remains that we have at the moment no verified sightings of the Prince of the Tower after 1483. And just for clarity, Rich III was ruling England from, is it June 1483 through to August 1485? So right slap bang in the middle of the reign of Richard III, the last known sighting of the princes. That's Mark I, you know, in favour of... Henry Tudor, Henry VII, not doing away with them. Second of all, the princes are sent into the Tower of London where they were last, you know, last last sighted under Richard III early in that summer of 1483. At that time, it's questionable whether Henry Tudor was even a viable candidate for the throne. Regardless of what people want to spout on social media and left, right and centre, there certainly was no plan for Henry Tudor to be a potential King of England from birth. There was no, you know, dream of Margaret Beaufort to see her son through. Arguably, the earliest Henry Tudor was put forward as a prospective candidate for the for kingship is November 1483, after the collapse of Buckingham's Rebellion. Traditionally, the view has been that Buckingham's Rebellion in that summer against Richard III was always in mind with putting Henry Tudor on the throne. I think that was all about making Buckingham king. So if we take that, um, that idea that the prince had disappeared before Henry Tudor is even put forward as a potential king, you know, what kind of hindsight does this guy have that he can somehow, you know, bump off a couple of princes when he wasn't even next in line for the throne? There were still so many people ahead of him with claims to the throne. You know, he'd have to somehow get rid of them all, which again is an argument in defence of Richard, actually. You know, he'd have to get rid of a lot more other people in the kingdom with the claims. If the boys had somehow existed through to 1485 and through to the reign of Henry VII, why didn't Henry come across him in the tower, order them killed, then simply present them in public and straight away say, lo, behold, I have found some dead children that have clearly been murdered under the previous reign of evil Uncle Richard. He never did that. You know, Henry never reveals publicly what he found um, he never publicly reveals any bodies. He just sweeps the matter under the rug and gets on with it, which really also buys into my thought that the boys were locked into a chest and thrown into the Thames. Um, that's the, the theory that I am now favouring. 
Um, hence, there was no bodies in the tower for Henry VII to come come through. Um, furthermore, throughout this period of 1483 and 1485, one of the principal conspirators in Henry's favour is the boy's very mother, Elizabeth Woodville. Now, we could argue that she was hoodwinked by Margaret Beaufort into believing that Richard had killed her boys and that she should now come and support, you know, the saviour Henry. Or equally, she may simply have believed that her boys had been murdered by Richard, who is also on record for having executed one of her other sons. So she already knew that Richard was a murderer of her boys, and she simply saw Henry Tudor um, as the best way out of her present situation. And finally, he wasn't even in the country in 1483 to 1485. You know, we really have to believe that these boys somehow survived, locked away from the world, all the way through to 1485. Something would have slipped out throughout the century, some sort of payment record, some sort of sighting. You've got to feed these people. You can spend just half an hour looking at the chamber records and the account records of this time. Those guys recorded payments for everything. Everything was meticulously recorded. I just don't believe that something would not have slipped out during that period. You know, August 1485, new clothes for the two boys in hotel room 102. Something would have come out. So, no, I don't think Henry VII murdered the princes in the tower at all. I just think he did very well out of the misdeeds of somebody else whose name begins with R. <laughs> not, a, not necessarily thinly veiling who you think might be responsible, <laughs> Nathan. <laughs> uh, Matt, Nicola, do you have anything, uh, any thoughts to add about Henry VII before we move on to Margaret? Um, not really about Henry the Seventh. I think I think I largely agree with Nathan. Although I have a slightly different uh, viewpoint on the Buckingham Rebellion, whereas you know Nathan's just said he thinks the Buckingham Rebellion was all about Buckingham. I think it was all about um, Henry. But you know that's fine. We we agree on most things, so it's fine to disagree on a couple of things. Um, I don't know enough about the idea of the possibility of the princes being locked in a chest and thrown into the Thames to be able to comment on that. But what I would say is that I think that I think that Thomas More has been very heavily slated and criticized over the centuries. But my own feeling is that yes, okay, there are things that we can say that's inaccurate, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But I do think that there is no doubt that more was in contact with some sources who were well placed to know potentially what had happened to the princes in the tower. So um, you know, I'm I'm kind of now questioning whether the bones found under the staircase now could possibly be those of the princes, but I do still think that unfortunately that they were disposed of on uh, on Richard's orders and and certainly not Henry's I think as Nathan's quite clearly said uh, really in many ways Henry was in the right place at the right time in so much that he was able to benefit from uh, somebody else's misdeeds um and he, but really I mean as I said before I think the fact that um, Henry is so keen to get to the bottom of the identities of the pretenders suggests very heavily that he hasn't known exactly what was, um, sorry, what had happened to them. And I also think, you know, when there are rumours that the Earl of Warwick has been done away with, what does Henry do? He gets him out and, and shows him to people. So, and obviously poor Warwick does end up dead later on, on Henry's orders, but there's no, um, there's no secrecy about that. So I just, I don't think, no, Henry had any involvement. I'll just add some context in there to the, the whole um, body in the tomb thing. Uh, there's a chronicle written during the reign of Henry VIII, um, or perhaps the reign of his son, by a Welsh chap called Ellis Griffith. Now, okay. Ellis Griffith wrote uh, a chronicle, you know, of this period. It's in Welsh, so it's not really been studied all that lot uh, amongst um, English scholars. In, in, in his account 
of what happened to the princess of the tower. Ellis Griffith, in keeping with people of his time, he puts the blame on Richard III. He, in fact, named somebody called John Adlington as being the person who committed the deed for Richard. I've tried to do some basic research. I've not come across a John Adlington, so I don't know if there's perhaps been a bit of a mistranscription or whether it's just a made-up name. I'm not sure. But he does confidently assert that the boys were locked into a chest, taken out to an area in the Thames estuary called the Black Deep, and dropped in. Now, the Black Deep is a massive, uh, you know, tidal lake part out in the Thames estuary. It's still called the Black Deep today. It's quite a forbidden area and quite a heavy shipping lane, quite a dangerous area if you ever happen to be caught up in that just as a simple, most obvious thing to do with a pair of dead bodies, that is such a simple, logical thing to do from the Tower of London. At night, you know, even under the cover of daylight, who's going to query a chest being taken onto a ship and quietly being slipped over? Um, You know, they certainly weren't going to be dropped right outside the Tower. I don't buy into the idea that they would ever be buried within the Tower. That seems completely foolish. Um, who, Who... how many people have watched murder documentaries? You know, don't bury someone you've murdered in your backyard. You're going to get caught. Um, so I don't really put too much um, too much thought into the whole Thomas More bones under the body. But again, maybe science will prove me wrong. I'm not sure. But I do think that this Alice Griffith's idea of the boys being thrown into a chest, into the black deep, as I imagine many people were throughout the history of time, you know, very much like a, a mafia graveyard out there. Um, I think that makes perfect sense to me, hence why there's never been any more sightings, any more um, knowledge of what happened to them. And I think that story is interesting as well, because, I mean, I, I don't believe more. I don't think those bones in the Abbey belong to the princes in the Tower. But we know, for example, Moore's brother-in-law, John Rastel, John Rastel, I think, at exactly the same time that Moore is writing his story, writes his own history and explains the fate of the princes in the tower and says that they were in a a chest taken out into the channel and thrown overboard. So I think there's, you know, if more knew, why is his brother-in-law around the same time writing something very different? If Tyrrell really confessed, how come nobody knows about this and is still having them in boxes and, and chucked overboard in a ship and all that kind of thing. So I think to some extent this plays into the, the, the complete, ambiguity and uncertainty of all of the sources when they come together. There isn't one coherent story of what happened to the princes because there isn't the evidence to tell that one coherent story. Richard might have murdered them. Something else might have happened to them. We just don't know. And I think all of this variety in the story really just exposes how uncertain we are about exactly what happened. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good point. I I also was not really familiar with the um, chess story. I think I had read about it in with with the Thomas More um, with his works, but I did not know about the Welsh source. So that's that's really interesting. I um I mean, if it if it is like a mafia graveyard, I don't know how feasible it would be to maybe do like some dives there and see if you know there might be like a two child size chest <laughs> that we could. Uh, try and and bring up but um but yeah that's that's really really interesting so that's a no for you on any sort of involvement from henry the seventh pretty firm yeah <laughs> I, I, i'm just on that point i mean talking about how history can always c- uncover some gruesome but interesting facts i've been reading this week about lake mead in uh, nevada i think which was always famously suggested to be a mafia burial ground from Las Vegas, where mobsters would put bodies into um, into oil drums and put them into the lake. Now, in the last couple of years, this lake has been drying up at incredible levels because of climate change. And we're suddenly finding these oil drums. I say we, not me personally. I'm not out there in Nevada uncovering ex-mobsters. But, you know, local law enforcement are suddenly uncovering all of these dead mobsters. And apparently there's quite an, there's quite an old, there's quite a, a lot of elderly men in America currently worrying about suddenly these bodies that they, that they killed, you know, 50, 60 years ago are being uncovered. And that's just something you would never have, they would never have adjusted for something like climate change that would dry up this lake 60 years ago. So who knows what will crop up um, in future. Maybe the Thames will dry up and there will be chests all over the place. 
for the hope of the future. I hope climate change uh, doesn't get that bad um, before we can we can do something to stop that. But uh, but that is that's a good point. Um, and I I think about that often when I think about them testing the bones that are in the Abbey. That I mean that would have been inconceivable for us to 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 be able to say you know with any sort of certainty that those might happen to be the bones of the princes. I'm still hopeful that we uh, will be able to to test those maybe uh, during my lifetime and at least put that to rest. Uh, the the rumor of them being buried uh, under this staircase at the tower. But I do think I think it's interesting what you say, Nathan. That uh, would you bury them there? You know, would if if you if you were Richard, um, say, and if you were involved uh, in this, would you bury them at the tower? It doesn't really, and that's something I had never even really thought of. As simple as it sounds, I had never thought, you know, wouldn't they be taken somewhere else? Because that's what makes sense, Matt. Um, I would just say that Annette Carson has done some some work on the idea that they were buried because the story goes that they're buried ten foot deep under a stone staircase during the night, and then all of that is put back, and nobody notices anything. And then, if you believe Thomas More, a lone priest comes along a bit later and digs that same hole back out again under a stone staircase ten feet deep and removes the bodies and takes them somewhere else. And I think just the sheer amount of work involved in digging that deep into the ground under a stone staircase with nobody noticing what you're doing, nobody querying why there's a patch of freshly dug earth in the morning. Oh, and where have those two boys gone? It just it would feel like absolute madness to bury them at the bottom of the steps of where you've just killed them. If and this and this was a live in work in palace. It's not like today where, you know, five thirty the beef eaters are chucking you out and locking up the gates for the evening. You know, there isn't any out of hours working at this time that could avoid any detection. The only thing that I would say, and I'm I'm not saying that I, like I said, I do, I am challenging that view myself as to the veracity of that. But the only thing I would say is that, you know, we sat here saying, oh, it's it's ridiculous. He just wouldn't do it. But having said that, (laughs) there are other things that we think, well, it's ridiculous. You know, he just wouldn't have done that. And, you know, come on. And that's true of all people. I'm just saying, you know, the logical thing people have said and that I would still argue, you know, if Richard wasn't responsible, why did he not just produce the princes and say, here we are? But he doesn't. And I'm not saying that that means he's responsible or not, whatever. But I'm just saying that there are things that we think, well, that's just madness. Why would he not have done that? But he doesn't. So I'm just saying... I think that, you know, we can question all these things and say, well, that's that's ridiculous. But we just we don't know, because that's why we're still that's why we are still talking to you about it today. And that's why we're still fascinated by it all these hundreds of years on. And the same with the bones, really. I think even if they are tested, it, all the only question it answers is whether those are the bones of the princes and, and nothing else. And unless something else emerges, we are still going to be questioning, well, how did they end up there or not? Whatever the case may be, we don't, we just don't know. So even if those bones are tested, then it still raises as many questions as it answers. And that's just the way it is. That's a good point. We, uh, we're not going to stop talking about this anytime soon, are we? (laughs) Even if we, even if we figure out that the bones uh, are of the princes, you know, we might know ultimately where they ended up, but not necessarily how they got there. Okay, Nicola. So I'm going to, I'm going to come to you last because I do, I want you um, to be able to sum up some of your ideas on Margaret Beaufort. Matt, I'm going to come to you next. So I know like we've kind of been alluding to, you know, that you you have these theories on what might have happened to the princes and how maybe Richard isn't guilty uh, of any wrongdoing in this instance. So I, I guess that's my question. Do you think that Richard had any involvement in this, whether directly or indirectly? Or do you think that he was just completely hands off um, and innocent when it comes to the disappearance of the princes, just in your opinion? If you use the word disappearance, then Richard is 100% involved because they're in his care and they they disappear from public view on Richard's watch. My my point, my argument, I guess, is that that doesn't mean murder. Mm -hmm. I think there are several, I think there are several holes in the idea that 
Richard murdered the princes. So Nathan mentioned, you know, why why doesn't Henry the Seventh display these bodies? People often say, why doesn't Richard the Third display bodies? And that's that's my big problem with it. If Richard the Third kills the princes in the tower, it's to prevent them being used as a threat against him and his throne. But for that to work, people have to know and understand that they are dead and gone. So there's lots of talk about deposed monarchs are always killed. Edward II, Richard II, Henry VI. But all of their bodies are always displayed. And in in recent memory, Henry VI, but also the Earl of Warwick and his brother, their bodies are displayed so that people will be clear they're dead. They're not coming back. They are no longer a threat. They are no longer a factor. So as distasteful as it may be for Richard to display the bodies of children, he needed people to understand that they were dead. He could blame natural causes and that it kind of doesn't really matter whether anyone believed what he said. They just needed to know the boys were dead and couldn't be used against him. So not displaying the bodies, for me, is a bit of a, a hole in the story. Why doesn't he produce the boys? I think we can cover that off, I guess, by talking about... So at the start of the, the 15th century, 1399, Richard II is deposed by Henry IV. To most people, Henry IV isn't Richard II's heir. That position belonged to the Mortimer family which in 1399 is in the person of two very young boys, both under the age of 10. And so these boys are put into kind of loose custody. Everyone knows where they are. They're abducted actually by members of the House of York with the plan to put the older of them, Edmund, on the throne. They're quickly recovered, put into much tighter custody, moved around a bit, end up in the household of Prince Henry, the future Henry V. When he becomes king, he releases them. Uh, Edmund is the fifth Earl of March, serves the Lancastrian regime impeccably until his death. So if I'm Richard III, and I, and this is part of Richard III's family history, you know, he's, he has Mortimer blood, there's a perfect template for how to deal with two boys who arguably have a better claim to the throne in some people's minds than you do. I would just say you skip the bit where everyone knows where they are and they get abducted and used against you, and you go straight to the bit where nobody knows where they are. And that doesn't mean that you've imprisoned them or put them in a dungeon. That means, for my money, they're, they're secreted and looked after. You just don't make public where they are. And then if they come out later and they decide they want to make their challenge for the throne as adults, then you deal with them as adults, much as Henry VII did with Warwick, you know, keeps him in prison as a child until he's 24 and old enough to be treated as a man and is then executed. It's kind of, there's some real exceptionalism about the idea that Richard goes straight to murdering children as a first response to, to any kind of a crisis in 1483. And, and I would say, you know, Nathan was talking about there's no snippets of information that have turned up to, to show that the princes survive. But we've got odd cryptic things that could have slipped through. So Sir James Tyrrell goes over to Calais and onto the continent in 1484 with about a year's worth of the Exchequer's income. And we have no idea why he goes there and what that money is for. So it's possible you could suggest that he's taking one of the princes over to the continent and that money is to provide for their education and looking after them. We just don't know. That money is never recorded as being spent on anything. It just vanishes. We have the Council of the North. So they, ha they set down these household rules for the Council of the North uh, during Richard's reign. And it talks about the children being served at breakfast. Now, this is before Elizabeth of York and the Earl of Warwick and some others arrive. So was it set down in preparation for the future arrival of children or was there already a child there, one or both of the princes in the tower, who just aren't mentioned by name? They're just called the children. And that's why those kind of little snippets slip through. I don't know. I'm guessing, you know, I might be clutching at straws here. I mean, one thing I would say, Richard has 17 nieces and nephews on the day that he is crowned Richard III. And the day that he dies at the Battle of Bosworth, he has 17 nieces and nephews, excluding the princes in the tower. So there are 17 other potential threats to his throne. And Elizabeth of York is being used right at the centre of a plot to dethrone Richard III. And she is in his care from April 1484 until his death. And he never, ever moves against her. He tries to arrange a marriage for her to a Portuguese prince. That's how cruel he is to someone who's being used in a plot against him. So why would he necessarily feel the need to murder his two young nephews without trying anything else? I think it's possible 10 years down the line, Richard might have got to the point where he thought, do you know what? There's no other answer here but to, to kill them. I just don't see that as his first answer 
to an emerging crisis in 1483. I don't see him rolling up in London and thinking, right, time to kill some kids. Just don't see that anywhere in his makeup or his previous character or as a likely response to to that kind of crisis in 1483. So for my money, Richard is 100% involved in the disappearance of the princes in the tower. I'm less certain he's involved in the murder of the princes in the tower. I like that. I think that's a, um, that's a good distinction to make because we do, I think a lot of people use those two words interchangeably. I know uh, I certainly do that um, when talking about the princes just because they are never seen again. So I think it's easy for some people um, to to jump to the conclusion that when they disappear uh, in the summer of 1483, that obviously, you know, they're no longer living. But I feel like, Matt, I think you present a case that if it was 2022 and we were talking about this and you were Richard's defense lawyer, I would say you've given enough reasonable doubt that we can't, we cannot convict Richard III on this podcast right now. Uh, We can't say that without a doubt, um, you know, he's 100% guilty because like you said, they're, they're just are so many possibilities. Um, and I think chasing that money is, it's interesting, you know, to think why was this money, especially going to the continent? And then it, it, you know, it just, it seems like the trail of that, um, has, you know, maybe evaporated and that we don't know exactly what it was used for. So I think it is, it's really, really interesting to think about the different possibilities that whether they, you know, survive, um, or, not. Um, I think it's it's interesting, which is obviously why we're still talking about this, but it's interesting to think about the different possibilities of who might have been involved and to what extent and to what ends. Um, if Richard was involved in their disappearance, you know, what what might have actually taken place uh for him to achieve his goal of having, you know, more stability in his reign. Is there anything that you either of you would like to add, Nicola, Nathan, to that before we move on to Margaret? I was just going to say that actually this is, I do think that um, this is why Matt and Nathan and I work really well together because we do have different views. Um, But I think ultimately we, none of us know for sure if we are right and will very openly say, look, if evidence comes out that shows that my theory is wrong, fine, fair enough. And it's just all about being balanced and, you know, and also about being open to the fact that none of us know for sure. And there could be evidence that comes out that smashes my theory to smithereens. And if that happens, then fair enough. I don't think any of us are die hard enough to say, well, you know, Rich is the best thing since sliced bread. Margaret's amazing. And, you know, Henry's perfect. I think we are all realists in that respect. So I think the, the, the past is the past has already happened. We're not going to be able to rectify anything that's occurred. We can only keep on reinterpreting it. Yeah. Hopefully have fun while doing that. Yeah. I'm certainly having fun. Um, I think the the three of you are that's why I was so excited to have you on the show that you I mean, you're all really well versed in this history. I feel like there, I can't really imagine three better people um, to have having this type of a conversation on a podcast, but also that you're respectful of each other's opinions and viewpoints and in the amount of time that each of you has put into this research. And because I know this can be, it can be like a, a contentious issue, right? People get, they do get kind of stuck in their ways when you're thinking about the princes in the tower. It's obviously an emotionally charged issue because you're talking about something possibly just really horrible uh, happening to two children, right? Who who wouldn't have any blame um, to lay at them aside from their birth and that they just happened to have been born to a king who died too soon uh, and threw the, the country kind of into a power vacuum. So I know it can be it can be easy to get you know heavily invested um, in defending your uh, chosen theory or you know the person uh, who you might study, but but I think you know the three of you you do a really great job at presenting uh, your own research and your own theories in a really balanced and respectful way. So I I thank you for that. I do I want to make sure that uh, that we come back and talk about Margaret a little bit because I I feel like we should just hashtag like justice for Margaret uh, with this episode. I know it's. <laughs> It's like one of my personal um, crusades. And Matt, I know you're not the biggest Margaret fan. You, uh, you've 
you've made that clear. So uh, please feel free to respond to this if you would like to. But but Nicola, I do. I want to come to you because, you know, Margaret, um, I feel like kind of like the back of your hand. Is there any way because she she was in England at the time. So she doesn't have this um, excuse of geography that Henry VII might have. And we do know, like Matt said, that she schemed a little bit, right? She was she was heavily involved in politics at this time. Do you think that, that there's any chance that she had any sort of role in the disappearance um, of the princes or in whatever you know might have happened to them? No, I think it's as ludicrous as the notion of her smothering Jasper Tudor to death in the White Princess. It's just she just didn't happen, in my in my opinion. Um, and I just think that if there, I mean, so the idea of Margaret as a possible candidate for their removal doesn't come until about 100 years after her death, roughly. And supposedly this source had been seen, which suggested that this cunning countess had had put these boys to death, whatever. But I just don't subscribe to that. And you could argue that, yes, she had motive, but I don't think that she had opportunity. And I think that had... Margaret been involved in any way, then there would have been some whisper of it, no matter how small in contemporary sources. And we don't have any of that. And I think also the fact that it is such such a recent thing is also very suggestive of the fact that, you know, people just weren't talking about this t- until 10 years ago or so. And nobody really considered Margaret as a possible candidate. And I think that there is good reason for that. And as Matt said, yes, there is evidence. You know, we do know she was a bit of a schema. But I think that generally speaking, you know, I think really it's based on nothing. Unfortunately, well, I don't know why I'm saying unfortunately. It's not unfortunate. Um, <laughs> I admit that. But yeah, I think ultimately, um, I'm not saying that Margaret's perfect by any means. She was human. She had the same flaws and imperfections as we all have. But was she responsible for removing these two children in some way? No. Okay. That sounds great. Matt, Nathan, anything to add into that? Or do we just want to, do we want to leave Margaret and move on? <laughs> I'd only say that having, having written a book called The Survivor of the Princes in the Tower, I don't think anybody killed them. So I absolutely <laughs> support what Nicola says. I, uh, I always describe Margaret Beaufort as someone who I struggle to like, but find it impossible not to respect and admire. I, as a Ricardian, probably I, I struggle to like her because she was convicted of treason against Richard and was right at the core of bringing him down. But also what she achieved in her life is absolutely astounding. And some of the legacies that she's left behind are absolutely incredible. So whilst I might struggle to say I'm a fan of Margaret Beaufort, I also think she was an incredible woman who achieved incredible things. And I think finally, the problem that Henry VII and Margaret Beaufort both have is a PR problem in that we only have those two famous enduring portraits of them that depict uh, Henry the Seventh in his mid forties after years of illness, uh, Margaret Beaufort later in life very pious and devout. If only we had you know holiday pictures of them when they were younger. Henry Henry the Se- Henry the Seventh must have been a really charismatic man to lead an army towards certain death. He must have been some sort of people person. And Margaret, of course, loved dancing. She loved gambling. You know, if we had a picture, you know, a portrait of Margaret 25, I think history would have judged the pair of them a lot kinder. I think That's- the same for Richard. Yeah, as someone who, uh, who my time period is kind of like the Edward the Fourth reign that I'm really stuck into right now. And Richard is just completely different during Edward's reign than what we see often portrayed of him later, that he was, you know, loyal. He was a good brother. He was um, someone who was really respected and feared militarily. And, and I think you're, you know, you're absolutely right to point this out about the three of these historical figures that we, I think we have a really stereotypical view of them. And I think whichever stereotypical view you might subscribe to, it can kind of, um, 
it can impact how you how you view them as individuals and what they might have might or might not have been capable of. And I think that the princes in the tower, it's so it's just kind of like a case study based on who you you know who you think might be guilty or not guilty. It's kind of like a case study on how you see these, especially three individuals in the past. We won't get into Buckingham. I don't know if anyone wants to defend him. Um, we can talk about him a little bit in the uh, in the last question if you want. Um, but but yeah, I think it's it's important to remember that we're only given a really limited view of what these people were actually like. Uh, and it can be kind of hard to determine motivations or capabilities based on the, the just stereotypical view of them that has been handed down to us. Can I just yeah. say, I'm not going to sleep tonight because I've now got images of Henry VII in a pair of tiny swimming trunks on the beach with an ice cream, having his picture taken on holiday. And that's going to, that's scarred me. That's going to haunt my mind. Someone, someone out there is going to Photoshop that. I, I hope you know. There's going to be... Will do it. Please don't. <laughs> and I just have to say, actually, that my new hashtag, which I pr- started promoting last month, I really need to get on it because I want to get it trending, is the Beaufort Babe. Because I'm all over this. I think that Margaret, in many ways, and I, I've talked about this before, that I mean, what um, what Nate says is absolutely right. We are kind of, we're so heavily influenced by these images that we've got. And this, it is hard to remember that these people were younger, living, breathing people who had other, you know, they had more to life than um, to, there was more to life for them than that. And, you know, Nathan commented on Henry's chamber books earlier and it's the same with Margaret, you know, actually you look at these and you see, you get such a good sense of them as people. It's a shame in some ways that, well, in many ways that we don't have that same sort of evidence for Richard, because actually I think then, people may have a more balanced view of him. So we are just kind of reliant on the fragments that survive and that are handed down to us. And, you know, we make our judgments right or wrongly based on those. I love, I love the hashtag. Uh, I love the movement to, to kind of, you know, view these people as more whole individuals than what I I think we have uh, traditionally done in the past for all three of them. But Nicola, I will tell you, I've started referring to Margaret as Maggie B. I think it it just adds like a little bit of like spice and flavor to her a little bit. So when I'm talking about uh, her just with like my fellow uh, history nerd friends, I call her Maggie B just to, and feel free to, to use it. I don't even know if I made it up. I might've heard it somewhere. Um, but I love your hashtag. Nathan, <laughs> yeah, do you call her Maggie B? He does do that. Yeah. 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 I call her Maggie B for quite a while while I was writing my Beaufort book. Um, same as, uh, uh, possibly great uncle, uh, Thomas Beaufort, Tommy B. Tommy. I don't know, Tommy B. <laughs> Maggie B. I love that. I mean, I feel like historical nicknames, right? You can't, you can't get much better than that. Um, and we spend so much time thinking about these people that it, you know, it, it, I think it makes sense to, to add just like a little bit of flavor in there. So the, the last question, and I know I've taken up a lot of your time. Thank you, uh, all three of you for being so generous with that. But the, the last question, and you can pass on this. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to. But I wanted to give you the chance to place your bet just based on your opinion, obviously, of <laughs> now now I feel like I have to be careful with my word choice. Who do you think is responsible for the disappearance of the princes? Or Matt, we're gonna start with you. So if you just if you want to talk about maybe what you think their fate would have ultimately looked like, I would love to hear. And again, you can pass if you're, you know, if you don't, if you don't wanna, you're not a gambler like Maggie B. You can pass, um, but if you if you want to place the bet, I'd love to hear it. None of you are lucky enough for me to pass on this question. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Matt wants to pass. I'm going to subject you to my opinions on this. So, I mean, I always say, as we've been saying all along, I don't know. I think there are several potential outcomes that see the boys survive beyond 1485. My, If I'm pushed, if I had to set out what I think happened, I think when Richard goes on his royal progress... In the late summer of 1483, he moves the boys out of the Tower of London. I think the younger one goes over to the continent to his sister, Margaret, Duchess of Burgundy. That may be why Tyrrell has all that money over there um, to, to pay for his upkeep. And then I think he emerges in the 1490s as Perkin Warbeck and is, is kind of written off as an imposter. But I think there is lots of suggestive evidence that he could have been the real 
Richard, Duke of York. Again, I don't know, but that's what I think happens to him. The older of the princes, I think, is the one that Richard wouldn't have sent out of England because he's the the more dangerous, the more likely to be used against him. So I think perhaps he travelled north with Richard. We have the, the Silesian knight, Nicholas von Popelau, who writes an account of visiting Richard while he's around Pontefract and places like that. And he talks, again, in really vague sort of sideways terms about a boy who was present and it's been suggested that he could have been talking about one of the princes being at Pontefract Castle at the same time that he was. But it's not clear. That's what he means. So I think Edward V then spends some time in the north, the idea being that you try and raise him to be loyal to Richard in in castles stocked with men that have been loyal to Richard for over 10 years, people he trusts, people who will keep his location a secret. I think when Henry wins at Bosworth, you get a mad rush up north, which is definitely about retrieving Elizabeth of York and the Earl of Warwick, but I think also may have been about retrieving Edward V, at which point I think he goes to the most natural place possible. He goes west to Ireland, which has always been loyal to the House of York. And then I think he emerges in 1487 at the head of what we know as the Lambert Simnel Affair, which I think is written off behind this idea that everyone in the Wars of the Roses is called Edward or Richard or Henry. So they go, well, they've got an Edward over there. We've got one in prison. And they they talk about this being an uprising in favour of Warwick. Um, but I think it was an uprising in favour of, of Edward V. 1487, the timing is is interesting because Edward V would have been 16 and a half, same sort of age as the Black Prince at the Battle of Cressy, same age as Henry V at the Battle of Shrewsbury. Um, and, and if this is the, the son of the most feared, respected and successful warrior king in living memory, the man, an undefeated man on the battlefield of the Wars of the Roses. Not many people can say that. He's a good person to follow and he's suddenly the right age. He's not far off the same age as his dad started. So then the question is, defeated at the Battle of Stokefield, what happens to him? I don't think the Lambert Simnel that is captured and goes to work in the kitchen is really the boy that was leading that army. I think he's just someone that this is all constructed around. So either Edward V dies at Stokefield or he escapes from that field or he's captured uh, and imprisoned, and I don't know what happens to him after that. So that's my guess, because it is just a guess. Well, and they're all just guesses. Um, but I think that that gives us a lot of interesting rabbit holes to spend years going down. So <laughs> thank you for that. All right, Nicola, we're coming to you next. So do you want to take a, 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 a shot in the dark at this? Uh, based on your opinion, what you think happened? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah. I mean, Matt won't be surprised to hear because he's had it many times before. But I think that they were killed, and I think that Richard was the likeliest candidate, um, you know, for that. And I can't. I, that's just. There's nothing else to add on it, really. We've sort of spoken about it, and it's just black and white, plain and simple. I think they were murdered. I think Richard was what done it, or what who done it. <laughs> I think um, I, I think you're right that Matt's probably heard that a, a time or two, but it is. I mean, it's kind of like yeah, yeah. It's it's like Occam's razor, right? It's just the yeah. the simplest uh, solution that I think most people do tend to go with. That Nathan, do you want to do you want to yeah. place your bet? For, for my money, it's all in Richard the Third. Um, it's the it's the likeliest answer. It's the straightforward answer. If you take into the context of that summer where I think Richard has stumbled to the throne, he's certainly no ambitious monster. He's backed into a corner by the Woodfields. He's fighting for his life. He's taken step-by-step escalation, um, and he's ended up on the throne almost by accident. Um, it, it's, a, you know, it's a fraught period. He's facing impending downfall from the off. He, 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 if he is not given the order to, to kill those boys to try and solidify his grip on the throne, somebody under him has done it. Um, I was thinking earlier, why didn't Richard present the bodies? I can imagine him saying, you know, hey, Alan, hey, Dave, did you, did you do what I asked you to do? Yes. Where are the bodies? We must present them to the, to the London public. Oh, well, sire, they're in a trunk on the way out to the Thames estuary. <laughs> you know, so I can imagine perhaps something as simple as that's why Richard was not able to display them. Whether it was Richard, Buckingham has a massive case to answer. I think I'm very 50-50 on him. It can fall either way. But the ultimate thing for me is that it doesn't matter. Too many people believe Richard did it. 
and that proved his downfall. Henry Tudor never becomes King of England ever in a million years unless Richard III first becomes king. Richard becomes king. Rumours swirl, whether they're made up or whether they're accurate, that he's had a part to play in this and it has cost him his life and his dynasty. And I think ultimately that is the key to it all. I cannot think of a better uh, point to end on because you're, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, right? We can talk about this stuff until we're blue in the face, but ultimately, like we've said earlier, it's not something that's going to change the outcome, but man, is it fun to talk about. Uh, so thank you to the three of you for, for coming on and giving your time uh, to chat about just this, like I said, in my opinion, the most fascinating uh, historical mystery that we have out there, mostly because we just... It's impossible to say, right? But uh, but you all have given us a lot to think about. I thank you for your time. This has been um, absolutely wonderful. And and I really, really appreciate it. I'm going to be listening to this episode about 50 times. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Thank you all. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap of our episode on the disappearance of the princes in the tower. I hope you had as much fun as I did. As always, thank you to all of the guests who appeared on this mini series on rumor and gossip at the Tudor court. I had a lot of fun and I hope you did too. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. 